Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Wassalatu Wassalam, Ala Rasulillah, Amma Bad. Today's question is, is Islam and Darwinian evolution compatible? Now, in order to understand the answer, we need to find out who this handsome gentleman is and about his book, which he published in 1927. Now, this man is an evolutionary biologist. His name is Julian Huxley. I'm sure you've never heard of him before, but I'm sure that his work has impacted you directly. Julian Huxley was an evolutionary biologist, a very prominent evolutionary biologist at the beginning of the 20th century. He was, if you like, one of the main people involved in what was known as the modern synthesis, which is when they took Darwin's theory and they took genetics and they did a synthesis. So he's one of the most prominent figures in evolutionary biology in the last hundred years. Now Julian Huxley was not only a evolutionary biologist, he was also a militant humanist and atheist. And his book is called Religion Without Revelation. Now you can start to get a feel for what type of religion he was speaking about. Now Julian Huxley believed that traditional religion is coming to an end. So Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Taoism, Lady Gaga, whatever you want to call it, it's all going to come to an end. And what needs to take over is a new type of evolutionary humanism. Those are his words, evolutionary humanism. Evolutionary humanism, according to him, is a new world religion. And this new world religion, he believed, had to be propagated to the entire world. Now, interestingly enough, he was not only a uh, philosopher as, long, uh, as well as an evolutionary biologist, he was also the first president of the United Nations Scientific, Cultural and Educational Organization, UNESCO. That's a very prominent role for somebody who wants to propagate atheist type ideas, humanist type ideas, because in a way, the UN is a world body, and in this world body, you have a special education department. And the first president of the education department is a man who is a militant atheist and who says in his books and his writings and his lectures that we must teach the world this new religion of evolutionary humanism and we must do it through the education system. So you can start to understand that Darwinian evolution is actually two things. And this is why the question is Darwinian evolution compatible with Islam, we'll need to make a separation between these two types of definitions of Darwinian evolution. The first is that it is a scientific theory, which is a valid scientific theory, a valid sci scientific theory model paradigm, which is working within the field of evolutionary biology. That's not really incompatible with Islam for reasons I'll go into later. But Evolutionary humanism, if that's what's meant by Darwinian evolution, then absolutely no. Islam is not compatible with evolutionary humanism. Now, what is the difference between the two? First, we have a science, which is a valid science. And this valid scientific theory, like all scientific theories, is not absolute. Any book, and as we're going to see later on, this is a consensus in academia, that the academic view on scientific theories is that scientific theories are never absolute. They are always approximations, they are always tentative, and they never reach certainty. So science, Darwinian evolution being a valid science, this is the mainstream view in academia, right? That Darwinian evolution is actually a science. The popular understanding, which is propagated by figures who uh, are well-known atheists, uh, evangelists is that is actually evolutionary humanism and that is the difference that we want to try and uh, separate today that the, the, there's an academic level and there is a popular level and we want to know the difference between the two so evolutionary humanism and this is something which is beyond doubt as we're gonna uh, go through the slides and we'll see during the Q&A it is beyond doubt that evolutionary humanism actually exists because evolutionary humanism is a manifesto according to its proponents. Now, what does evolutionary humanism in it, and you can define it in many, many different ways, and I'm not saying every single evolutionary humanist has the same belief, but there are some general uh, themes that they all agree about. They assume science leads 
to truth. They assume science leads to certainty. It is atheistic and it is a fully fledged religion. Michael Roos, he is an atheist philosopher of science. He is a Darwinist. He doesn't challenge Darwin. He does believe in Darwin. He is a prominent writer on Darwinian evolution. He recently published a book with Oxford University called Darwinism as Religion. Now what he's saying here is he's not saying Darwinian evolution is not science. He actually makes that clear. He says, look guys, it is science. He says Darwinian evolution is science, but he says it is also a secular religious perspective. And you can't basically, uh, you can't deny that that's also there. So what he argues in his book is, from the very beginning, this wasn't just a scientific theory, this is also a alternative to traditional religion. Now, if anybody picks up books, popular books, by evolutionary biologists who are well known, you will understand that statements like this aren't really scientific. Now, I'm not talking about an from an academic perspective, you're studying evolutionary biology at academic level, and you pick up books at university level written by academics. I'm not talking about those books. I'm talking about popular books written by evolutionary humanists under the guise of evolutionary biology. So remember, we're trying to make a separation here. You've got these guys who are claiming they represent biology, and you have actual academia, and there's a difference between the two. So this is the former. Now, look at this statement from uh, Richard Dawkins. Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually satisfied atheist. Now, that's from his book, The Blind Watchmaker, which is a popular book about evolutionary biology, and that is a statement coming out from a scientist in a science book, yet it is not a scientific statement. If we tweak that slightly, so replace Darwin with Einstein and replace atheist with Buddhist. Einstein made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled Buddhist. We would laugh at such a statement, we would say this is ridiculous. But when it comes from an atheist, it's kind of almost accepted as norm. But what we need to realize is this. If there is a scientific theory, which is a valid scientific theory, but it's also a theory which happens to, or you think it supports your worldview, then of course you're going to be biased in its favor, and you're also going to overspeak the evidence. Now this is from another book called Sapiens, which is a very popular evolutionary book. It's actually, I think, one of the most popular books in the last decade. Um, it's, it's sort of as popular as The Blind Watchmaker was back in the 80s. This is by the uh, atheist evolutionary biologist Yuval Noah Hariri. What he basically says in this book, alongside all the rest of the biological information which he has, which is obviously valid, he says, there are no gods in the universe, no nations, no money, no human rights, no laws, and no justice outside the common imagination of human beings. Now, if you look at that statement, that statement is not really a scientific statement. Because there's statements about uh, meta-ethics in here. You also have statements about the existence of uh, supernatural entities. You also have the idea that morality is subjective. So you get all of this stuff but this is not really science, but this is actually in a popular science book. So you can start to understand that Julian Huxley sort of set the ball rolling, but these are, if you like, the guys representing evolutionary humanism today. So it's not just a scientific theory, and this is something that's beyond doubt. Now, even within evolutionary biology, and this is very important, we have credible evolutionary biologists who are atheists, like these two, Masatoshi Nai and that's Lynn Margulis. Both of these are atheist evolutionary biologists. They don't believe in the Darwinian mechanism. They believe in alternative theories, which we're not going to go into today before maybe you can go in Q&A. Lynn Margulis, um, her symbiotic theory is taught at every single university in the entire world. In fact, even here at LSE, you can go to the library. You can get a book on biology. It's impossible that you have a university-level textbook about um, uh, symbiosis uh, or about evolutionary biology without mentioning her theory. It's just impossible because she's a very important scientist. Likewise, Masatoshi Nai, very important evolutionary scientist within the subfield of population genetics. Both of these have said, and these are people who are 
against the Darwinian mechanism. They don't believe in the Darwinian mechanism of evolution. They believe in alternative mechan mechanisms of evolution. She calls uh, Neo-Darwinism an Anglo-Saxon religion. And likewise, Masatoshi Nye, when he's trying to promote his theory against Darwin's theory, he says it is uh, Darwin in our field is like God. You can't actually challenge Darwin. And when science becomes dogmatic, that's when you have to actually challenge it. So you have this sort of academic pressure about evolutionary biology, uh, about Darwinism within evolutionary biology, and something which is unprecedented. If in the field of uh, theoretical physics, um, we have the string theory, we have all these d relativity and quantum mechanics and all the rest, you will not find scientists saying, we can't breathe, guys. We can't promote uh, uh, alternatives. We can't challenge this thing because of this, uh, uh, you know, restrictions academically. But you do find atheist evolutionary biologists complaining about that within Darwinism. So clearly, it's not just a theory. So evolutionary humanism, just to recap, is different to the general idea about the scientific theory of evolution. It's the idea that science, and again, like I said, it's a general definition. Science leads to truth, and science is the main root of knowledge. These two ideas we're going to break down for the rest of the presentation. Right? We're going to break down the idea that science leads to truth and the idea that science is the main root of knowledge. And you don't even have to be a Muslim, Christian, Jew or some sort of religious person to know that. You could be a secular atheist, a secular rationalist. You could come to the exact same conclusions because to come to these conclusions, you do not use any theology. You're just using basic, standard, secular academia. So, we have a child asking you for something, you feel like giving something to a child, we have this emotion to want to help human beings, we have this sympathy, we have this empathy, we have this care, and this is a marker of human beings. Yet, how could you scientifically test moral obligation? You actually can't. So this whole idea that science leads to truth, well, what about morality? Secondly, if I was to ask you a question, does Kengis Khan exist? Assalamu alaikum. He's a good friend of mine, that's why he distracted me. <laughs> so, does Kengis Khan actually exist? Now, Kengis Khan, there's no way you can scientifically test if he existed. Firstly, we don't know where his grave is. All we have is historical accounts, right? And this is something that we know through history. So this is a historical truth. This is not something we can scientifically trust. Trust. Do you have a great, 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 great grandfather? Now, Chances are you probably don't know where he lived, where his grave is, whether he, you know, lived in a hut, whatever. You don't know any of these things. But you believe that he existed. Why did he exist? Because you exist. So what are you using? You're using logical deduction, which is again something science has to presuppose. Science cannot actually prove. <coughs> Does Micronesia exist? Micronesia is actually a real country. And if I said you know, does this country actually exist? You could go to the world map, yes it's there, or someone could say that they're from Micronesia, but you haven't been to Micronesia yourself. So even as human beings, we accept testimonial knowledge in our day-to-day -day interactions. Okay, solve this equation. Solve this equation using science. That would be absurd, because science presupposes mathematics, you can't actually do that. Or some sort of philosophical uh, deduction, right? If all A is all A R B, all B R C, then all A R C. Well, how could you show that works scientifically? You can't, because science presupposes this type of logical deduction. Okay, your mum made you a cake. She wrote, "I love you" on top of it, and you want to scientifically find out the personal. Why did she do it using science? What are you going to do? You know, stick some probes in her brain, find out what's going on? You can't actually use science to do that. Okay, things like Metaphysical truths. So, the world is real. Other minds do actually exist. The world wasn't created five minutes ago with the inbuilt memory that it's billions of years old. These are metaphysical truths which cannot be scientifically tested. In fact, science presupposes them. So, just to wrap up one particular idea about evolutionary humanism or evolutionary humanists, what they actually push. Science is the only route to knowledge. Well, in that case, what about morality? It can't answer the why question, because science can explain, for example, uh, you know, this mouse, how does it work? You have this electronics, you have this particular whatever, right? It can explain to you all the mechanics, 
but it cannot explain to you why it exists in the first place. So the why and the how are two different things, and this is a category mistake. It can't answer metaphysical questions, and mathematical and deductive truths are presupposed by science. Likewise, testimonial truths. Okay, if I was to get my friend over here, Nazim, and bring him up on, uh, on, on the, uh, uh, at the front, and if I was to dissect his brain, 99% of his beliefs would be non-scientific. That doesn't mean irrational. Because in our popular culture, science means truth. Science means logic. Science means everything, right? No. What we're saying here is 99% of the beliefs that he holds, which are rational beliefs, such as beliefs about morality and personal, uh, you know, persons and minds and the fact the world is real and mathematical things and testimonial truths, even the idea that your mother is your actual mother is not based on science but based on testimony, 99% of your beliefs are non-scientific. Ultimately, even the statement, science is the only route to knowledge, is self-defeating because how can you test that statement using science? You actually can't. So, we just dealt with the first idea of, ev of popular evolutionary humanism, which is science is the only route of knowledge, right? So, that's gone to the bin. Second idea, that science leads to truth. Now, this is a popular misconception. It's not just an idea which evolutionary humanists actually push. It is actually a genuine public... Uh, uh, misunderstanding. At an academic level, scientists and philosophers of science know that science doesn't lead to absolutes. Science only gives you approximations and because of some issues in the philosophy of science, you can always have complete different paradigm shifts and things can actually change. Now, so what do you do in science? You ask a question, do some background research, use observations, test out the theory, you keep repeatedly testing it, and then you come to some sort of result. You come to some sort of theory. Why do we love science? Because science is amazing. We can actually do amazing things using science. We can use Newton's laws and the uh, New Newtonian model to make precise predictions, and those predictions would actually come true. And all of us are impacted by science in a very positive way. So of course, we're going to love it, and there's nothing wrong with loving it. The issue is when we misunderstand what it can actually achieve. It can achieve a lot of workable theories, but it doesn't give you absolute truths. The first problem in the philosophy of science is the black swan problem, which is, I have a scientific theory, all swans are white, right? And I keep observing swans, yep, this one's white, this one's white, this one's white, and what comes along one day as a black swan and my theory is thrown out. This is known as the problem of induction. Secondly, we have the scattergraph problem. We have this issue that the same observations can give rise to different theories. This is very important because this is something which Charles Darwin mentions himself and Charles Darwin was a very uh, important evolutionary scientist and he did understand some aspects of philosophy of science which Sadly, today's evolutionary humanists don't. He wrote in the beginning of The Origin that, look, you can use the same facts which are in my book to come up with a theory which is the opposite to mine. And he still believes his theory is correct, but he says that's still a possibility and we have to, you know, put theories together and then try and adjudicate between them. So you have all these green dots. These green dots are observations. Observations obviously don't change. So based upon these observations, you can make a... Uh, straight line curve, uh, straight line, you can make a curve, you can make a bell curve, you can make a sign. So you can have this, a whole bunch of theories based upon the same data. So that is the scattergraph problem. So because of these two problems, and there are actually quite a few more, science can always change and the conclusions can always be revised. And this is a academic understanding within philosophy of science. There's nothing controversial about this. Science doesn't lead to certainties. Now obviously what doesn't change is direct observations. Shape of the Earth, the fact that we have um, uh, water as H2O, fossils exist, stars exist, but this is again where we have a misconception. Observations are not science. Observations are used to do science. Okay, so let me just give you something to try and help you. So you look up at the stars, you look at the different movements of the stars. You can use those movements and observations of the stars to come up with astronomy, right? Which is a valid science in physics. 
Or you can look up at the stars and you can come up with all types of palm reading and astrology, which is obviously nonsense, which is pseudoscience. So the same observations can be used for science and they can also be used for pseudoscience. So science is not just observation, science is much more than observations. As you can see here, there's a whole method, which is why there's the conflation between observations and science. It's kind of like, how can you say science is going to change when the shape of the earth is not going to change? That's obviously based on a conflation. Now what's amazing is science can work for a very long period of time, yet it can still change. And we have a classical example in Newtonian to Einsteinian physics. And this is where we had the idea that the universe is working according to this Newtonian model. And you know, the amazing thing about Newton's laws and his model was you can make a precise prediction, right, I think this planet, based upon my calculation of Newton's laws, is going to be here at this particular time next, time next year. And it would be there. For 200 years, the Newtonian model worked really well, which is why scientists were really finding it difficult when they went through this uh, conceptual change at the beginning of the 20th century. Einstein came along and said, guys, Newton's model really works and it's helped us out a lot and we've achieved so much using it, but its fundamental assumptions are incorrect. So what did he do? Einstein came along and said, you see back here, Newton's doing his nice little calculations and these calculations you know we all used to do at school and stuff um, the definition of mass that he's using is actually incorrect so what did he do he changed the definition of mass time and space was supposed to be fixed according to a Newtonian model and um, Einstein came along and said no actually it's like fabric it's like changing it's flexible um, gravity according to Newton was supposed to be a pulling force according to Einstein, is due to space-time curvature. So we have massive conceptual changes in something which worked well for 200 years. Now think about this. We went to the moon, if, if you don't believe we went to the moon, that's a separate matter, but let's assume we did. So we went to the moon. We went to the moon based upon Newtonian mechanics. Now Newtonian mechanics and the Newtonian model took us to the moon, apparently, and it's based upon something which Einstein later showed the assumptions were actually false, but it worked. So just because something works doesn't mean it's true. And this is something which philosophers of science highlight. In fact, there's a lot of philosophical works which show we have lots of scientific theories in the history of science which works really well, yet they later turned out to be false. So university students at LSE, I'm sure you have cars like this. So this particular car, you have nitrogen boosters. Imagine there's a guy, first year undergraduate, he's really, really excited. He's enjoying his nitrogen boosters and I come up to him as a middle-aged man and I say, um, son, so you see that nitrogen that you're using to, you know, boost up your car or whatever. Um, this nitrogen was discovered using the theory of phlogiston, which later on turned out to be false. So he's going to find that conceptually quite difficult. One, because he's probably have a ha he probably doesn't understand what I'm talking about. But secondly, because his car works. Nitrogen works. Nitrogen is an element. But it was discovered using a theory that was actually false. So just because something works doesn't mean it's true. Okay, even in physics today, we have the theory of general relativity. We also have quantum mechanics. General relativity, quantum mechanics, both theories with great predictive power, both theories which have been very helpful in whatever technologies we've been, uh, you know, enjoying, especially relativity. Now, what's really interesting is this. This particular theory, relativity, and this particular theory, quantum mechanics, they fundamentally contradict each other. They both can't be true in the literal sense. It's impossible. So we have two horses here going in opposite directions. Scientists don't say, right, let's reject relativity and jump in the quantum mechanics uh, camp or let's jump from here to there. They say no, let's ride both these horses and let's see where they actually go. So theories work even if they contradict each other. Another very important aspect of science is methodological naturalism. This is very important to understand. Methodological naturalism, what does that basically mean? It basically means is this. We walked into this room, 
all of us are scientists and now that we are scientists we adopt the assumption that anything we are trying to explain we will only explain using things which are natural so natural effects have natural causes so there is a patient the patient is you know going through some pain we're not going to say the patient has a soul we're not going to say the patient has an immaterial mind no everything has to go out of the window which is not naturalistic even as a scientist if you're looking through um, you know you, if, if you're studying animal behavior you can't say this is moral and this is immoral because remember methodological naturalism is all about physical 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 effects physical causes so even talk about morality from a methodological naturalistic point of view means nothing now this isn't actually a bad assumption this is actually a working assumption in science and there's nothing actually wrong with it in fact the first scientist Hassan ibn Haytham and I and we should actually know the history of science he was actually the first modern scientist he is the father of the modern scientific method he lived approximately a thousand years ago he adopted methodological naturalism now obviously he didn't believe in naturalism Philoso what's known as philosophical naturalism he obviously believed in God he, he was a Quranic scholar and he did actually say I study science to get closer to God but there's a difference between methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism which we're going to do a bit later on right so the way that Richard Lewinton, an atheist uh, evolutionary professor from Harvard, explains it is this. We are forced by our a priori, which means before we look at evidence, adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. What's he going on about? What he's basically saying is this. Before we look at evidence in any scientific discipline, and he's here talking within the context of evolutionary biology, but this applies to all of science, we will assume there is only natural law, and there is only nature, and there's nothing metaphysical. There are no such thing as morals or souls or minds or God, anything like that. There's nothing like that. That's just a working assumption in science. That's not really a problem, because remember, science is an attempt to explain how things work. It's not an explanation of why things exist, right? So it's not necessarily a problem. It is a problem when somebody conflates methodological naturalism with philosophical naturalism. This is a very common mistake evolutionary humanists actually make. So take the statement of the evolutionary biologist Scott Todd. He actually summarizes it really, really well. This is within the field of evolutionary biology, by the way. Even if all the data pointed to an intelligent designer, such, an, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. So you can say, you know, this particular feature of the human being or this particular feature of the caterpillar or this particular feature of this bird is amazing, so there must be a designer. He says, right, within science we can't say that. Within science, a priori, before we look at evidence, there's no such thing as uh, anything supernatural, anything meta metaphysical, if you like. It, it's all natural. So what he goes on to say is this, and I think this is the part which is very important. Of course, the scientist as an individual is free to embrace a reality that transcends naturalism. And this is actually what Ibn Haytham was doing and uh, many of the early Muslim scientists and also scientists today. They knew there's a difference between the methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. One doesn't entail the other. Now, what does methodological naturalism entail for biology? It basically entails this. There's no such thing as design. A priori. Forget the evidence. A priori, it doesn't. There's, there's, no, there's no such thing as design. There's no independent ancestry. What does that mean? That means... You can't just say human beings appeared in the history of life at 70,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, a million years ago, whatever. They appeared in the history of life without being linked to something else natural. It's impossible. Two. Sorry, that was number two. Number three, naturalistic purpose. So science can only tell you things in terms of nature. So as Richard Dawkins puts it, the highest rationale for human existence is to pass on your genes. Right? 
So methodological naturalism will have these uh, conclusions within science. And remember what we said, it's a working assumption. So if we're working within the field of biology and we're adopting the cult, if you like, of evolutionary, uh, of methodological naturalism, we can't walk out the door with those conclusions because you started off on an assumption. So as Francis Crick, an atheist evolutionary biologist, he also, he also won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the structure of uh, uh, the DNA. He says, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Now, some religious people look at that and they get upset, but that's actually just methodological naturalism. So, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong necessarily with that picture, unless Francis Crick believes that's literally true. That's okay as a working assumption, but not something you can take away as truth. Now this is, remember, no separate ancestry, right? Human beings have to be linked to something else. This is the way Gareth Nelson, a, a evolutionary professor, explains it. We've got to have some ancestors, meaning humans. We'll pick those. Why? Because we know they have to be there and these are the best candidates. That's by and large the way it has worked. I am not exaggerating. And he's obviously an atheist, mainstream secular acad academic, and he does believe in human ancestry. He does believe in Darwinian evolution as well. All he's making clear is the assumption. By default, before axiomatically, whatever word you want to use, Human beings have to be linked to something else because of the assumption of methodological naturalism. So what he's saying here is, whether we like it or not, we're going to be linked to something in nature. Thought experiment. That's not the way evolution actually works, according to the orthodox understanding. But if I was to make an evolutionary hypothesis, and I wanted to test an evolutionary hypothesis, which was basically this. If I was to say, because remember the whole point of Darwinian evolution is you can get from bacteria to an elephant. You can get from any organism to any organism given enough time and given environmental conditions. So, if I wanted to make a hypothesis, and let's call it the null hypothesis, HO, which is human beings were created on earth at a particular point in the history of life, 50,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, 200 years ago, whatever, at some, at some time, without being linked to something else. So that's HO. And I have another hypothesis, H1, which is human beings have a common ancestor with a pig-like creature, right? With a creature which looks like a pig. By default, HO will go out the window. There's no such thing. You have to give a naturalistic explanation. So even this would work scientifically, it would still be a scientific hypothesis, but the other actually wouldn't be. And in fact, Eugene McCarthy, and this is completely fringe, but I just found it really uh, amusing. Eugene McCarthy, he's an atheist evolutionary biologist, he does believe in a human-pig-chimp hybrid theory, and he does actually put that forward. In fact, there's actually some really interesting similarities between humans and pigs, which don't exist between humans and chimps. Right, so Darwinian evolution overall, is based on a probabilistic framework which has multiple assumptions and there's disputes about its most fundamental ideas. I didn't actually cover this, by the way, but this is something which is agreed upon by any evolutionary biologist in the world. There is no evolutionary biologist in the world unless they don't know what they're talking about. Except that they will understand that Darwinian evolution is based on a probabilistic framework. It has assumptions such as gradualism, horizontal gene transfer, natural selection, and so on and so forth. And there's also disputes and alternatives and other ideas. So that's just the state of things. So remember the first idea of evolutionary humanism that we're breaking apart is that science only leads to truth. We dealt with that. This is the end of the second part, which is that science leads to certainty. And that's certainly not the case. So, to summarize. If somebody says, is Darwinian evolution compatible with Islam? Yes, if it's a scientific theory, because we can accept any scientific theory as Muslims, because we don't even have to be Muslims to know this, but science doesn't lead to absolute certainties, right? Even if a theory contradicts Islam, or some aspects of it contradicts Islam, so what? We've had this in the history of uh, science. We had a, 
uh, in the mid uh, 20th century, 1950s, we had the steady state model, the idea that the universe is eternal. Who believed in this? Einstein, Niels Bohr, all the major guys. There's a consensus amongst physicists that the universe is eternal. 1950s, not that long ago. Right. Would we have accepted that in the 1950s as valid science? Yeah, we would accept it as valid science. Doesn't mean we believe it to be absolutely true. Doesn't mean we need to take it and then we need to, because obviously the Quran doesn't say the universe is eternal. The Quran says explicitly the universe has a beginning. So there's a contradiction. But we would accept it as a valid theory. We'd, ex we'd accept that this is their view, but we wouldn't accept it to be absolutely true because of the philosophy of science. So. Darwinian evolution, if it's defined as evolutionary humanism, which is a popular understanding, which is atheistic, which is naturalistic, which has this idea of the erosion of God, the erosion of morals, the erosion of, of even truth, interestingly, interestingly enough, because um, if we only evolved to survive and reproduce, then how can our minds arrive at truth? Because truth can be adaptive, it can help you survive, but sometimes it, ca it can't. In fact, this is a worry which Darwin had, and this is still a worry which evolutionary humanists, some of them today, and some philosophers of science actually have. Natural selection isn't there to track truth, it's there to help you survive. Now, lastly, this is very important. We need to understand, and we don't even really need to be Muslims to understand this, but science is not the only root of knowledge. There is this whole popular perception, I mean, a, a few years ago, I remember, um, when I finished work, this is back in the days when we had internet cafes, you guys are probably too young to remember what those are, but before we had internet on our phones, we used to go to these places called internet cafes. So in, 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 the, in this internet cafe, I went to this internet cafe and I used to see this guy, uh, he owned the cafe and you see, I used to talk to him now and again. So I said to him, do you believe in God? He said to me, I believe in science. And he said it in such a religious way. And it is almost like science replaces God, science replaces this, science is, you know, this holy cow. What we need to do is we need to break out that um, inferiority complex, that science is some sort of gospel truth. There's many ways of arriving at truth. Of course, science is a valid uh, root of knowledge as well. But there's reason. There is using your logical deduction and coming to conclusions. There's also empirical data. Just pure empirical data. There's self-evident truths. The fact that the world is real. The fact that we have minds. The fact that we can trust our minds. The fact that truth does actually exist. There's introspection. And of course, there's testimony. Valid. That doesn't mean someone comes in here and they smell of alcohol. And they are like falling over and they're telling you there's an elephant going nuts outside temple station. Right? That's not what I mean by testimony. Testimony is something which is in a science. Which is you, you test. You, you want to... You have to check about authority, you have to check about different lines. Uh, there's, there's a whole science to it, but testimony is a valid source of knowledge. In fact, it's the major way that human beings know what they know. But additionally, this is very important, as Muslims, we have something separate to that. Everything that I've said in the presentation so far, I could have said, even if I wasn't Muslim, even if I was an atheist. Everything I've said so far is theologically neutral, metaphysically neutral. This last part is not, which is why it's in red. I hope you remember that. So, fitra. All human beings are built upon the fitrah. The Prophet ﷺ said this, that human beings, uh, they're born with the fitrah. He mentions this in the Qur'an as well. So, we know that there is a creator and this is the fitrah which Allah has created us upon. Now, the thing about the fitrah is that the fitrah can become clouded due to social pressures, due to maybe some sort of uh, uh, intellectual confusions, due to sins, whatever, desires. The fitrah can be unclouded by revelation, by using logical arguments, by even this sort of, uh, um, uh, the logical sort of uh, package that we have here. So the fitrah can even be unclouded according to logical and sound arguments, according to, uh, you know, spiritual experiences. So the fitrah is something that a human being has, which is always there. And I, I, I always have this story in my head and I always try and mention it because I found this very, very powerful. A few years ago I was at a course and there was this guy who, he was brought up in an atheist household, so he never had a concept of religion, never had a concept of God. He just had this, from a young childhood, he was taught, there is no God, it's all nonsense, his parents were atheists. All his life, he was an atheist. Yet, I believe when he was in his 40s or his 30s, he got into a life and death situation, he got, he got into a very serious situation. And what did he do? 
he called out to God. So the fitra was awoken. And when you, and even though he wasn't in a life and death situation, but he thought, like, I need help and blah, blah, blah. What's the first thing he did? He called out to God. And Allah says this in the Quran, that when a human being is on a ship, and they are, you know, they, they, they see cloud, they, they see waves, and they think they're going to die, they call out to Allah, and they, they, they make their worship sincere for Allah alone. Now, you students may be thinking, I've never been on a ship, but third year students in their final exams, will, you'll see that the prayer room is filled up. Human beings ask for help when we're in trouble. This is a basic thing. Now, what we need to understand is this. All of these great tools that we have, including science and including all these things, these are additional tools which are there alongside fitra. And this is, if you like, the composite package of the human epistemology of how we know what we actually know. And we should always keep that in mind. Everything good I have said is from Allah. Every mistake is my own. Jazakallah khair for listening and I look forward to your questions.